Well, hello plant lovers, it is Matthew in Melbourne welcoming you to my channel. Thank you very much for finding me. And if you're new here, I try to grow cool, cold, intermediate orchids here in Melbourne, Australia without help from much knowledge, greenhouses, grow lights, humidifiers, any equipment, really just me and them inside or outside, or we don't play at all. So plant lovers, if that sounds like your bag, do hit subscribe. I post every week on a Friday, very amateur ramblings, as perhaps today's video will demonstrate, but my ramblings might help you in your orchid growing journey. Okie doke, what is today about plant lovers? Well, there's sort of a motley crew assembled here, but it does all make sense and the stars have kind of aligned because I wanted to talk about terrestrial orchids. And what I've been doing is filming them as they bloom. So over the last year, I filmed little segments of different things flowering, but just getting it all together has proven somewhat difficult because some of them are difficult. Anyway, we've got some in bloom. We've got some that were in bloom a while ago that I filmed and some that I've managed not to kill, which I think is a great triumph. And then the surprise curveball, which kind of made me bring it all together to film it today, was I received in the post this box, which we are going to open from a viewer. Walter, many, many thanks for reaching out to me. This is an Australian terrestrial orchid growing on Walter's property, in fact, in his lawn, and he dug up some tubers and sent them to me. So we're going to look at that and I'm going to pop them up uh, and see how we go. But I won't reveal what this is just yet. Let's begin at the beginning. But before we get into these, I think let's step back in time to spring earlier in the year when one of my Japanese Calanthe terrestrial orchids was in full bloom and it was looking amazing, the best it's looked thus far in its flowering cycle. So let's go and have a look at that footage and how I look after that orchid. More terrestrial orchids. This one is Calanthe aristulifera. There we are. Now this is a fabulous terrestrial orchid that's found in Japan, Taiwan, mainland China, in damp, moist, foresty spots, but at quite a high altitude. So it is a cool, cold, well it's a cold grower, and does like quite a bit of, mm, quite deepish dappled shade. So it's an understory forest plant. A fabulous, fabulous plant and relatively hardy. So this is something that you could definitely grow in colder parts of the world. So certainly in Britain, um, even if you get frosts or snow, I think this is an orchid that you could certainly grow outdoors. Lots of the calanthes from uh, China and Japan can take those cold temperatures and do get light snow. So just figure out which species works for you. But in spring, and it is September here in Australia, one of the things to look for is the old leaves. Now you can see my old leaves here are relatively manky. Um, they have been shredded by slugs and snails and they've had 12 months of battering of rain and wind and sun. Anyway, they're a little bit sun damaged, a little bit old. It's time to exfoliate, I think. So what I will do uh, is just trim off these old leaves. Now, this is a very slow growing orchid. I've got two spikes this year and they are fabulous. And I'm really, really pleased about it. Uh, and it's taken, oh, I think probably three years to get to have two growth points with this orchid. So not something that's going to run riot in your woodland garden, which is a great place to grow it. Um, it does like those woodland conditions because it needs to be moist, it needs to be dappled shaded, and it can do with a little bit more brighter light in spring because imagine it's in a deciduous forest, more light, and then as the summer, the season progresses, it gets shaded by the, um, the leaf development. So a beauty, an absolute beauty, and quite a striking orchid, quite strong. Anyway, it is time for me just to trim off these old leaves because we've got this beautiful new growth here. And one of the other things we need to do to support this beautiful new growth is to fertilize it. So what I do earlier in the season, so usually in late winter, is put a topical application of some um, manure and or a sort of a compost with something like a dynamic lifter. So some quite enriched compost. So I just put a little layer of that on the top of the pot. And then in spring, now I will put a topical layer of a slow release fertilizer, which will release over the next sort of six months as the weather warms up. And then throughout the growing season, when I remember, because this is sort of out in the garden, I will uh, give it a liquid fertilized with whatever I decide that might be. And also sometimes a tonic, which can be a seaweed based tonic or a worm juice based tonic, which is not a fertilizer per se, but it's full of lots of wonderful trace elements, which help the plants. So all I need to do now is really 
trim this calante. So what I'm just going to do is just chop off these old leaves right down at the base. Any that are in good condition, obviously you'd leave, but these are really not. Um, I'm going to leave that one, which is an old leaf, but I'm going to take off this one because that is not looking healthy and wonderful. And I'm also going to take off this one because it is damaged and eaten and unattractive. And I really want to enjoy the flowers and the new fabulous green leaves. So there you are, isn't it fantastic? A beautiful orchid and they are so easy because I treat them like herbaceous perennials. So they just sit outside, they get rained on or not. Uh, every spring I put a layer of leaf litter and some manure and a little bit of new potting mix on the top and a little bit of slow release fertilizer and then just leave them to their business. The only thing to watch is of course slugs and snails because they do love those new shoots but other than that it's a very low maintenance orchid. It does take quite a long time to build up a decent clump of them so having multiple spikes was a wonderful wonderful thing for me this year. Uh, and let's see what happens next year. I have bought some new Calanthes of that type. And I also have a sort of related Australian one, um, which is alive and thriving, but yet to bloom. So who knows, maybe next year we'll get some action on that one. Okay, but now let us look at what's here on the table. So terrestrial orchids, as the name suggests, they live in the ground just like any other bulb actually. So like tulips or daffodils or herbaceous perennial plants, um, some of which can be evergreen and some are herbaceous, which means they die down in winter or sometimes they die down in summer, depends where they're from and what the relative climate is in terms of moisture and rain and heat, etc. Some are monsoonal, some come from very traditional sort of autumn, summer, winter, fall type of environments. So a bit of a mixed bag and I have had Mixed bag results. Hmm. So let's look at one that I'm just happy is still alive. Now this one, as you can see there, we have got three little growth points on this orchid. Quite nice, quite perky, quite happy. And it is a habanaria and it's called galar. Galar, actually galar is the common name for a particular sort of parakeet in Australia which has the most beautiful grey and pink foliage, very common anyway. It's also you, when you call someone who's been a little bit foolish, you call them a galah in Australia anyway, you galah. Anyway, <laughs> habanaria galah. Now, habanaria are tricky. These are Asiatic uh, terrestrial orchids and they do th live in a monsoonal system which means they get huge amounts of rain at a very condensed period and then quite dry, baking dry. And if you've ever been in a monsoonal country in the dry season, it is so dry and so warm and the soil is just baked hard. It's incredible that life cycle of moisture and growth and then stasis really during that hot period. So habanaria need that dry, absolute dry. This is one of the things when people say about orchids, give it a dry winter. There's dry and there's dry and there's dry. Now sometimes you can desiccate a tuberous um, orchid in winter by just keeping it bone dry and the tuber or the corn will just shrivel to nothing. Habanaria, however, do need that complete dry. So when the leaves start to turn uh, in autumn and they start to look as though they're on their death spiral, really reduce your watering and when the leaves look dead, stop completely. And in spring, very gently start to moisten the soil again and the minute you see any growth, just keep it really watered and really well fed because the plant's doing lots of growth. Now, this should have flowered by this point and I really don't think these are going to. But you know what, at this point, I'm not that worried because I'm just happy they've grown this year and maybe they just need to sort of fill up their tanks of energy like a daffodil bulb will to next year in terms of flowering, I'm not sure. I may not have also given them enough light when they first emerge. Now it's an understory plant, so it doesn't want direct light, but it does need filtered light, but not too little filtered light. Mm, so a hard balance. I'm not quite sure I've got it right. I have certainly killed many a habanaria before by, well, de complete desiccation at the wrong time or trying to counteract that by moistening them a little bit during winter and then rotting the bulb. So mm, it's tricky. However, this one, seems to have thrived in these conditions. I had another 
don't know if it's a hybrid or a species, and that just didn't. It just disappeared into nothing, and it had exactly the same care as this. So, telling you, they can be tricky. Anyway, I feel Galar and I have made friends and understand each other now. So, pretty soon, actually, this is going to start to want to have water withheld. The leaves are still looking green and juicy at the moment, but pretty soon it's going to go into the dry corner. <laughs> anyway, I'm just happy that this has survived. So the next thing for me to do is obviously to get it to bloom, which means feeding it and watering it at the right time when the corms are expanding underneath, which is towards the end of the season, but then stopping watering it at the right time and starting to water it at the right time. So I, I think I got those two things right-ish. Maybe the light was an issue this year. Anyway, this one, Habanaria Gala, is a work in progress. Another work in progress, plant lovers, is this pot. Now, as we can see here, we have got green shoots, which is fantastic. Now, this is a uh, Terrastylus rapanda, and this is a terrestrial orchid that is native to New Caledonia. But there are lots of these Terrastyluses around the world. In fact, there's a lot of native ones to Australia as well, which people do grow here. So it has quite a, this one has a sort of a brown hooded flower and it flowers throughout autumn and winter. So this is the time. It is dormant in summer. So this is one of those plants that wants a summer dormancy as opposed to habanera, which wants a winter dormancy. Hmm. Anyway, that's why it's sometimes really helpful to label your pot and say dry winter or dry summer, which I do, so I just don't forget. Anyway. Didn't do well for me last year, uh, and I've kind of given up on them, but I sprinkled some um, fresh potting mix and a little bit of manure on the top of the pot, maybe a little bit of slow-release fertilizer, and they've all sprouted. Now, already I can see that something, probably a slug or a snail, has been having a go at this. So I'm gonna have to elevate it and make sure that, is there any slugs on the bottom? No, and just make sure that it's out of the reach of those slimy little friends. I would be thrilled if this blooms. So some of those look actually quite vigorous. There's a tiny little shootlet coming up here. So we'll see. I'm very happy to see if I can make this grow as well. I don't know, terrestrial orchids are tricky. Um, Calanthes I find really easy. The ones with just, you know, sort of counter seasonal requirements, I do find tricky. But anyway, I am determined to have a go. So let's see how we go with this one. Strangely enough, Although obviously New Caledonia is a tropical island, it's to the northeast of Australia up there, um, a lot of their highland plants are actually quite cold tolerant. So you can grow them even in areas where you get sub zero or sub 32 degrees Fahrenheit temperatures. But anyway, uh, this one grows through winter, so it's probably not gonna be that cold tolerant, but nonetheless, I'm gonna give this a whirl. Um, it seems to be loving life here, and it does, I know, grow very well in Melbourne, so I should be able to grow this and bloom it. Next cab off the rank is this. Now, I've made a video about this before, and it's not quite open, but you know what? If I waited for this to be open, this wouldn't. So, win some, you lose some. This is an African terrestrial um, orchid, and it's a Stenoglottis longifolia, and I've made a video about this when it bloomed for me the first time, which I'll link. The flowers aren't quite open yet. It's a very lovely, soft lilac um, flower. Very, very beautiful, and it does clump up for you. Again, it's a terrestrial orchid, so it grows on the ground, in the ground, and likes a sort of a... Um, Again, it's more of an understory plant, but it does need bright, indirect, dappled light. You can imagine it's on a, a sort of an open forest floor. Now, I had a bad year with it last year. I don't quite know what happened. And again, I just sort of left it in a corner and it's done quite well. Now, it's a little thin. It was more vigorous last time it bloomed for me, but I feel that although it needs dappled light, I think it was just in a little too much shade, which once again is the problem. Finding that perfect sort of forest floor environment for me at the moment is tricky, but I'm just happy that the plant has bloomed and it's alive and happy. This again is a plant that is dormant in winter, so a little easier to manage, but again, you need to make sure that you don't rot the bulbs by getting them too wet in winter. But this is not one that wants to dry out completely, so I just leave this under a tree out the back, and I kind of just let it fend for itself. So it's managed quite well. I really want to, again, focus on this next year. It's been nibbled a bit because it's been out in the wilds, as it were, fending for itself, but I'm very happy that the flowers are there and they're gonna open. 
um, and it's a very, very pretty thing. And I think once you get the spot right for it, you can kind of leave it to do its own thing. And in Australia, in Melbourne, you could certainly plant it in the garden because um, you would just treat it as any other herbaceous perennial really. But there we go, late autumn and it's coming into bloom now. Okay, and then this charmer. Now, I actually filmed this this time last year and did the whole spiel about it. So let's step back in time and look at this flower 12 months ago. Plant lovers, on our terrestrial orchid journey, look at this little beauty. This is a North American native orchid, and I'm sure it'll be familiar to many of my North American viewers, and it is called Speranthes odorata commonly called Marsh Ladies Tresses, and it has these beautiful little white flowers sort of spiraling up the, uh, up the stem of the plant, which is where Speranthes actually comes from, the Greek meaning spiral, so there you go. Odorata, hen guesses what that might mean. Yes, it is fragrant, very gentle fragrance, and it's almost got a, an almondy smell to me, like a marzipan, mm, curious. Now this one is native to boggy, watery areas, so there you go, an orchid that likes to have its feet wet, and apparently it can actually grow in standing water. So if you're growing it like me in cultivation, you need to make sure that it is pretty constantly moist, basically if you just make sure that the dish is always a little bit moist at the bottom. Now in those conditions, it is not in full light, it is in sort of dappled foresty light, if you can imagine, it's more of a an understory woodland plant, so bear that in mind, not full on light, but probably good morning light and then dappled light for the rest of the day. And it is a herbaceous perennial, so it is gonna die down. I'm filming this in mid-late autumn here in Australia, and it is at its peak. It's looking absolutely beautiful. And in fact, I bought this bulb from Tonkin's Bulbs, Jane Tonkin, and I made a video with her about peonies, which I will link below. I have never seen anyone else selling it, so I was really thrilled to find it at a plant fair quite recently. And I've just noticed there's another little plant that's growing in the pot, so I'm very excited about that. So it has a tuber, and it emerges from that tuber in spring and is going to flower for you in late summer, um, early autumn, or in fact in my case mid-autumn. It's in a fairly loose terrestrial potting mix, so I would just use um, a regular potting mix and just loosen it up with some perlite or maybe charcoal as well, just so that it's not too condensed, but it does grow in soggy conditions so it doesn't really need to dry out that quickly, but anyway. There we are, Spiranthes odorata, and I'm really hoping that pretty quickly it will make a nice clump for me and I will have multiple flower spikes in the pot as time goes by. I will be repotting it into terracotta, but it was already growing. When it's dormant over winter, I might repot it. But there we are, Spiranthes odorata, and odor as it is in a very pleasant way. As I said, smells vaguely of almond meal. Anyway, a beautiful orchid, probably very familiar to you in the States, but not to me here. So this is one of my terrestrial orchids that I'm building a little bit of a collection of onto the next. So there you go. And I think actually this year, and it's in a dish because it is, it is a moisture lover. This year, I think it's even more vigorous and it's got a fragrance that smells like, like almond meal, I think. It's a beautiful, beautiful orchid. Um, Spiranthes odorata. I keep this outside all year and I keep it in a dish all the time so that it's constantly a little bit moist around the bottom. It does prefer that sort of moist, borderline, boggy environment. And this has done very well. Again, I've just left it because it's getting a little crazy out there. We're hopefully moving at the end of the year and I've kind of just taken my eyes off of the back jungle where some of these things are living. But this one has done very well for itself. It's again, getting the same dappled light conditions as our Stenoglottis friend, but perhaps a little bit more light and you can see it's much more vigorous. So next year, I will focus on giving more light to this one. Spiranthes, I don't know if you can see, but you can see that the flowers twist around, hence Spiranthes. And this Spiranthes leads me to the next most charming thing, which I mentioned earlier on, which is this box that arrived from Walter. Now this is an orchid called Spiranthes australis. Guess where it comes from? Yes, this, although there's a bit of a debate around this. So this orchid is found across the east coast of Australia, but also all the way up through Asia, across the east coast of China to Japan, and I think almost up to Siberia too. It is a herbaceous perennial terrestrial orchid and Walter has them growing in his garden. It's apparently very, very common in Eastern Australia, though I've never seen it. But 
Like its North American friend, it does like moist conditions. So you would find it in moist uh, areas. So perhaps by streams and by rivers. Yeah, so I've just never seen it in bloom. Hmm. Now, like these, it is a summer flower. So I'm not quite sure what we're gonna find. I haven't opened this yet, but I think they've gone into dormancy or died down. So Walter has been able to dig them up for me. So we'll have a look. And what I will do is basically pot it in the same manner as this. So this is just a regular potting mix. So I've got this one in, mixed a little bit of sand in it just to keep it uh, free draining. But then again, I'm keeping it in um, a moist conditions so it sits in a dish so that although it's free draining there's plenty of moisture available to the plant so I will do the same so why don't I swing the camera around and we'll have a look at this now spiralis astralis basically the same form that spiraling shape but this one is pink now I've got a label ready for this and Walter thank you so much for thinking of me and sending this let's have a look at what we've got in this very well arranged package I must say I am curious as to what these are going to look like. Hmm. Superb. Let's have a look what's going on here. Aha. Aha. There we go. Oh, goodness me. Look at those tubers. Wowza. Well, they're in very, very good condition. Nice and moist, which they need to be. Hmm. Okay, well, what I'm going to do is pop them up immediately. Let's see if I can get one out without damaging them. Well done, Walter. The sphagnum has kept them incredibly moist, which is what they need. So you can see how long those tubers are. Quite an amazing looking thing, isn't it? Wow. So the other realization is I'm going to need quite a deep pot for that, I think. But anyway, look at that. They're wonderful. So ultimately, it's going to bear a striking resemblance to its American friend, um, which I also planted in quite a, a long, narrow pot for the same reason that the tubers were this long. Well, thank you, Walter. Look at that. It's just so wonderful. Very exciting. So that is the tuber. This is Spiranthes odorata, the American cousin. This is Spiranthes australis. Basically, it's going to look the same, but have a purple mauve flower. And interestingly, the Spiranthes were named in 1810 by Robert Brown. Now, this is a name that crops up a lot in Australian botany because he was a botanist that was sent out in the, I think maybe the third botanic exploration of Australia by British botanists. The French were here just a little bit before and also named a lot of things, but Robert Brown was sent by Joseph Banks and he traveled across the, I think it was just the, the south, so from Western Australia across around the east coast uh, and named a huge number of plants. And he named the Spiranthes that he found growing here, which was this, and gave the name to the whole group, uh, even though they occur throughout the world. Uh, well, yes, throughout the world. Asia and North America. Anyway, so Robert Brown, 1810, Spiranthes australis. Well, Walter, thank you so much. I am now gonna go and pot these up. As I said, I'm gonna use regular potting mix, so nothing special, a little bit of sand just to keep the sort of coarseness and free draining nature of it. But like Spiranthes odorata, I will keep it sitting in a tray so that it's moist all the time. There we go. If slash when I get these to bloom, I will certainly show you. But Walter, thank you so much. Very generous of you. And plant lovers, if you want to know what I might be doing next week, you'll have to hit subscribe because I post every Friday. It won't be unboxing something from someone. I can tell you that now, I feel. But who knows what it will be, but you'll have to hit subscribe to find out. And I hope wherever you are, all is well in your orchid world. And I look forward to seeing you next week.